everyone, if you could go ahead and please take your seats, we'd really appreciate it. Thanks for joining us for the Healthcare Practitioners session on bringing farms and food to health. We've got three great speakers lined up. Uh, first will be Dr. Hubner. Next up we'll have Diana Dyer, and we'll finish with Coco Newton. And if you could please save all your questions to the end, we'd really appreciate that. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Hubner up. Well, I feel honored and, and appreciative to be here to talk to you folks. It's an amazing conference. And um, I've been totally uh, uh, impressed with the program and how it's been organized and the speakers. It's, it's fantastic. Um, yeah, my name's Chuck Hubner. Uh, I'm an allopathically trained medical doctor. I'm board certified in internal medicine. I'm board certified in rheumatology. Um, I'm also a member of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Um, I've been in medicine for 30 some years. I've got some harpoon marks, some scars, um, some bruises. I've been a patient. Um, I've, I've, had, I've experienced uh, essential hypertension, um, hypercholesterolemia related to the Western diet. I've gone through episode of physician burnout and severe depression. Um, I developed a weird systemic illness after a uh, pharyngitis. Um, and I'm speaking to you today as a physician and a patient. And <clears throat> five years ago, um, you know, my life kind of changed. My brother died of a heart attack at age 50. And I was on Lipitor and high blood pressure medicines and uh, was in decent shape, but not great shape. Um, and um, I started reading on the New York Times uh, website, uh, you know, more medicine is, is uh, you know, about cardiovascular disease and, um, you know, more cardiac care is not better cardiac care, uh, written by Michael Osner, who's a preventive cardiologist, that's not an oxymoron, uh, from uh, um, Miami. I then really got interested in food and how food affects our blood vessel health for one meal and endothelial dysfunction and went off on a tangent. I tend to be a little bit obsessive. My wife will tell you about that. Um, and so eventually, after a long, a long story short, I ended up at Cleveland Clinic Wellness Program run by Dr. Esselstyn and, um, you know, went on a plant-based diet. And um, when I came home from Cleveland Clinic, I told my lovely wife, you know, I'm going to become a vegan. I'm going to go on a plant-based diet. And she said, uh, good luck, buddy. <laughs> and so uh, my life is wonderful person. She's the light of my life. Um, and so I had to kind of do a lot of this stuff myself. And this whole process that I went through really changed my view as a physician. Um, and, you know, in six months I lost 35 pounds, got off my medicines, and my cholesterol went down to 103. Um, so that was kind of a transformative experience and, and changed my view of how we doctors look at ourselves and our patients. And uh, you know, we're trained under the biopharmacologic procedural uh, paradigm of, of uh, human health, which is a very truncated, uh, narrow view. So I've been in medicine for 30 years. Um, I want to, I got 20 minutes here, and, um, you know, I'm going to zip through these things and show you my view of, of uh, medicine, its dysfunction, and things we can do to help it. Um, these are seminal books. Uh, Overdosed America, John Emerson, The Broken Promise of American Medicine, um, How Pharmaceutical um, uh, Companies Are Corrupting Science, Misleading Doctors, and Threatening Your Health. That's John Emerson. Um, Less Medicine, More Health, uh, Tul Gawande. Uh, I'm sorry, this is H. Gilbert Welch, The Seven Assumptions That Drive Too Much Medical Care. Uh, he's wonderful. He's from Dartmouth. And then End of life, we've medicalized the dying process in America, uh, being mortal by Atul Gawande. Okay, so I've got, I don't have much time left, so uh, let's just try and zip through these. This is an hour presentation, we're doing 12 minutes. Okay, so um, I wanted this to be a little interactive. We've got some prizes. If people get the right answer to the question, uh, you, get a, you get a more kale shirt. Okay, does anyone know who that is on the far right there? You raise your hand. 
Raise your hand. Right. Okay, what size shirt do you t shirt do you wear? We got large and medium. Yeah, and you know, uh, these people had the worst immigration policy of all time. Okay, sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I apologize for this, but I'm sorry. The, the, the souls of physicians are being murdered. We're being murdered by the system, the bureaucracy. We've been turned into providers that click boxes. And, you know, I want to treat, I want to turn patients into people. Um, I'm not a therapeutic nihilist. We've got to use the drugs. They bring people back from the biologic, brink of biologic demise. But we have to use the lifestyle factors if we want to really maximize the health and outcomes of our patients. And so this is what I say to that. I mean, it's just we're getting killed by this. It's really keeping us from our message and, and, our, and our, our ability to be healers. <clears throat> so, you know, I, when I give this talk to medical professionals, I, I say, you know, uh, that spiritual people, their the job is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Um, we, have, we have too many specialists, not enough primary care doctors. Um, we have 70% specialists, 3% primary care doctors. The, uh, the foundation of a good health system is primary care doctors. But you can see it's all about the money. Okay, so the military industrial complex is like the, uh, the medical industrial complex. Highly interventional and not all that effective. <clears throat> So we do all these things that cost money but don't really improve patient outcomes. We put stents in coronary arteries that have blockages. Um, we put uh, hardware in people's backs that have back pain um, that may or may not need these. So there's a lot of waste in the system and it's, we get paid for doing more. Cardiologists, I mean, you know, they were held back on the, on the stenting of coronary arteries but then they started, uh, you know, they started, uh, uh, you know, doing other vascularizations. <clears throat> Arthroscopic surgery of the, of, the, of the osteoarthritic knee does nothing, nothing for uh, the patient, but tons of these are done every year. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of times what we do in medicine is we look at the patient as an ATM. How can we make money off this person? As opposed to our fiduciary responsibility, how can I make this person uh, well? <clears throat> um, you know, less medicine. More health, H. Grover Welch would recommend that. Johnny Emerson is wonderful. There's great YouTube videos. He's got a 17 minute YouTube video that's awesome. And H. Grover Welch has got like a six minute video that's awesome. Um, most drugs don't work for most people. Um, he talks about that in, in, in his book. Um, there's NNT, number of people you have to treat to prevent one event. If someone's had a heart attack, 50 people have to take Lipitor for X number of years to prevent one heart attack. So most drugs don't work for most people. Unfortunately, I've been part of this too. Uh, medical industrial complex has created a hu huge addiction, heroin uh, epidemic. We've prescribed all these narcotic pain, pain relievers that's led to the heroin addiction. It's just a massive problem. There's Abramson. It's hard for us to get data. When a drug rep comes to see me, um, right away I know that they're gonna tell me their drug is more effective than it is and, le and safer than it is. So we can't get good data. Most studies are corrupted. I mean, you just look at the, uh, the Vioxx and Celebrex story, how um, you know, the drug companies run these, these trials, and it's hard to get accurate data. But there's some websites where you can. Um, we use a pill for every ill. I see all these people that come to see me, these young women with chronic pain. They're traumatized. They've been raped. Um, you know, they're, they're post-traumatic stress disorder, depression. and their muscles hurt, and they come in and they're on this kind of medicines. I mean, this to me is pharmacologic assault. <clears throat> uh, antibiotics are way overused. We give rise to, uh, you know, colitis. Um, you know, exercise is, if we could put what, we, what you can get out of exercise in a pill, uh, it'd be a <clears throat> blockbuster seller. This is a great case. I talked to this guy at U of M who was an endocrinologist. He was talking about this patient he saw in his clinic. And, um, you know, he said, oh, man, his numbers were great. Um, you know, just fantastic numbers. Um, this is kind of what he looked like. Um, but this was his list of medicines. And, you know, that's just crazy. I mean, you can, this is a treatable disease, as, as people say, it's foodborne illness. Uh, this is Mark Ramirez. He's a U of M uh, lineman. 
he um, developed type 2 diabetes. He's Hispanic. Uh, was way overweight. Uh, was on a bunch of medicines. Went on a plant-based diet. In six months, he was off all his medicines. And he's a lean, mean, mighty machine now. So we have a passive receptive uh, medicine. We do things to people as opposed to people doing things for themselves, empowering themselves. Back pain is a good example of that. Uh, I do a lot of core exercises. I have a bad L5S1, um, but I'm not going to have surgery unless you know there's some sort of grave neurologic problem. <clears throat> core exercises, core exercises could be as effective as as uh, you know as uh, spinal fusion surgery. And you know, if you got a gut like that, it's not good for your back. Uh, you know, sleeping pills. Um, you know. Meditation and yoga are, are wonderful for our, our mind and mindfulness. 35% of women in Emmett County smoke cigarettes that are pregnant. Um, you know, it, we have to talk, people talk about, you know, pay for patient performance. I say pay for performance for the patient. I mean, the patient's got to have some skin in the game, too. I mean, you can't, you know, a person comes to see me, they got a hemoglobin of, you know, 12, and, you know, we can't go home and cook for them, then go to Johann's and get 12 donuts. Um, you know, hospitals, uh, you know, I think the hospitals, as Dr. Elson said, are, are cathedrals of sickness. Hospitals, there's, uh, I don't know, 40 hospitals in the United States that have fast food restaurants. Uh, they sell soda and stuff. I mean, our restaurant, I mean, our hospital's got all sorts of junk food in it. Um, and this is Cleveland Clinic. They had a McDonald's in the food court, but they since got rid of it. We should, people come into the heart attacks. Instead of giving a beer, better fried cod, cheese, pizza, and hamburgers, we should be giving them beans, kale, and sweet potatoes. Uh, you know, there's the doctor's offices that actually have pot machines in them. That's like having cocaine in a rehab center. <laughs> so end-of-life care, this is a huge thing, and we're not going to have time to do it, but I just want to mention that. We've medicalized the dying process in the United States. I'm all about death with dignity. We can be philosophical, religious, or whatever about it, but the way we treat old people in the last six months of their life is crazy, expensive, and abusive. So we got to get more uh, primary care doctors, pay them more. Um, you know, doctors are going to be looking at, you know, this is how some of us feel now. And, you know, are we going to be able to stay in the system? I'm one of the few doctors that still has a private practice. Doctors are going to be doing like concierge practice, maybe form a union. Um, the health, private health insurance companies, with all due respect to Blue Cross Blue Shield, are the problem. They're not the solution. And the elephant in the room is national health care. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let's, um, I have quite a few slides. We're going to just rock and roll right through them so that we'll have time for everybody to actually ask questions at the end. So don't try to feel like you need to actually read all my slides. I will talk you through them as to what is the actual important point. Do I have to point it at? What do I do? Point it at the computer? All right, how about if we do it this way? Okay, so then I can sit with you. Okay, okay. You ready to click? Yes, click. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I used the same slide this morning. I'll just very, very briefly again for I because I actually met some people at lunch who weren't here this morning. They missed the morning sessions. But you know, I stand here wearing multiple hats. As a healthcare practitioner, I am a registered dietitian and, and a member of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, trying to change it, okay? But actually, I spent 20 years talk about the you know, dysfunctional part and actually the best part of our healthcare system. If you are a trauma pa patient, we have it for you. I spent 20 years working as a dietitian in the intensive care unit. But long story short, I'm a multiple, multiple time cancer survivor. And at some point, I actually could not deny the voice inside of me that said, you should be doing something, I don't know what, but something within the cancer survivorship community. So ultimately, I mean, I just, without knowing what I was doing, I left my ICU job that I actually really loved and went out into the real world. And it didn't take long at all for the, essentially the cancer survivorship community and me to connect 
And I ended up having a private practice where I only saw cancer survivors. I wrote a book, um, A Dietitian's Cancer Story, which I will have out on a table here um, this afternoon after this session. And I went speaking around the country, raising awareness of the fact that nutrition should be as a part of true comprehensive cancer care, let alone prevention. But I was working with uh, you know, the survivorship community. And even then, that wasn't well, I would just say, and as a result of writing that book, I actually donated, I do still donate all the proceeds from that book to um, an organization called the American Institute for Cancer Research, which is the only nonprofit organization focused on the nutrition and cancer connection. And through that endowment that come from the sales of my book, I do fund research projects, and I'm going to talk about one of those in a minute. But even so, even, I mean, here I am doing this wonderful work with cancer survivors. Something's nagging at me at 2 a.m. when I'm sleeping at night thinking, oh my gosh, we have all these people getting cancer. This is not good enough to just work with survivors. And so essentially I have moved from one end of the healthcare spectrum in the ICU all, all the way over now to prime pure prevention with my organic farm. Oh, yeah, you're clicking for me. And so as a result, uh, when I you know, leaped out of the ICU into this real world, somehow, you know, the, the universe connects. And the Detroit Free Press came to me, phone call, hi, you know, I, I've heard about you. You're a dietitian and you're a cancer survivor. Could I do an article about you for the Free Press? It was a essentially a promotion for the race for the cure in Detroit. And I said, sure, without thinking that my life would change. Well, it did. They wrote a beautiful article in the free press. It before This was in the mid-90s, before the internet and the old-fashioned wire service. And that article that they wrote, essentially combining the, the stories of me as a dietitian and a cancer survivor, went over the wire service and over 1,500 people found my home phone number and called me. <laughs> you don't think that changed my life well, Italy? <laughs> So I'm off, you know, on that. So anyhow, what they said basically is, why aren't we getting this information that's in this little article in the Detroit Free Press in our cancer centers? Please write a book. Okay, so click. <laughs> so I wrote a book. I knew nothing about writing a book, but honestly, it's not rocket science. And so I wrote a book and published it myself because I didn't have time to find a, an agent, a publisher, to do all these things because these 1,500 people wanted my book yesterday. Okay, so I just figured out how to do it, and again, the universe brought me help. But the important point was, this is not to make me famous. You know, the proceeds are donated to this nonprofit organization that funds research focused on well, cancer prevention, but also cancer treatment and cancer survivorship. And my, the funds from my endowment specifically are focused on cancer survivorship research. Okay, next. Oh, and I guess that's it. So we've already talked about that. Next. Okay, so I'm going to launch into one of the research studies that actually my endowment is funding right now for the next three years. It started last year, and it'll be going for three more years. It's called Harvest for Health, and it's actually funded. It's going through the um, University of Alabama Comprehensive Cancer Center, and it is... Let's, Next. <laughs> this is very awkward. I'm sorry. You know, okay. And so it is a, um, a study in which the principal investigator is taking a, a whole group of cancer survivors, um, some breast cancer, but um, all kinds of others, and then pairing them with a master gardener, and probably everyone in this room knows what master gardeners are, and actually helping these patients with a garden who have never gardened before, and then measuring all kinds of outcomes from are you increasing your number of fruits and vegetables you're eating a day, are you exercising more, you know, are you sleeping better, are you less stressed, less depressed? I mean, these people are filling out forms, um, you know, like crazy, but. What she found in her first little small pilot study is that the, re the results after a year of gardening just blew everyone out of the water. You know, I mean, in terms of survivorship qualities. 
And so now she has gone on to actually have this funded, um, surprising larger, much larger study. Surprisingly, she was not able to get money from the National Cancer Institute to fund this. She actually has it funded primarily by a community foundation in Birmingham, Alabama. And they only funded part of it. And so that's where my endowment through this national organization has come in to actually fund the rest of it. So these are just some, you know, I mean, you can see, you know, nice, nice improvement. Let's go on. Okay, and this is just where all of her patients are coming from. And the beauty about this, again, is partnerships, 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 because she has people all over the state of Alabama. And how is she going to be monitoring them or working with them? And so it's these master gardeners. And there are so many master gardeners that want to be involved in this project that she actually has them on a waiting list, just like she has patients who want to be involved and could only take so many and has them on a waiting list too. Next, please. Okay, and so basically, as I said, she's pairing them with master gardeners. These are people that haven't gardened before. They're really starting from scratch. And so they're really going, it's the best way to actually get meaningful data in terms of impact. Next. Oh, yeah. Okay, next. Again, this is just like her study criteria, I'm sorry, her study criteria for who's included. But the basic point was she really wanted people that had never gardened before and actually had some physical limitations. So she would have some good basis for um, comparison. Oh, this is just everything that she's studying. But, you know, these people are very willing, they're very willing to pull out um, um, and fill out surveys. This is just a one graph. It's an ongoing study. There's not a lot of data from this much larger conglomerate and study group. But here's one that she showed me, and even so, all the patients are not um, included with this data. But she's me actually measuring IL-6, which is a measure of inflammation. It's a molecule in our blood that measures inflammation. Nothing um, on a chronic basis is good about inflammation. It is definitely correlated with um, all of our core, um, chronic diseases. And so what she was able to show is that just after one year, and this will be a three-year intervention, is already, you can see the line decreasing, um, which is all good. Okay, and there will be just scads of more data. I mean, the actual um, quality of life data, but also the biochemical data, all of which are biochemical markers for healthy aging that she is measuring that my study or my fund is helping her to complete. Okay, this is the slide I really want to, I'm really excited about to show you because it's going to segue right to what Coco Newton is going to talk about later. But, Wow, okay, how do I explain this? Okay, there are two groups of people. So there's like essentially hunter and gatherers in Tanzania, and then there are urban Italians. And they were measuring in this study their content and variety and quantity of their microbiome. The, the, all those critters, those trillions, billions of microorganisms in our gut. These are the Italians living in the city. You can see, you know, that there's it's not much there's not much color here and not much variety. And so these are the foragers in Tanzania. And what they're you can see all the different colors and all the different varieties. It's much, much different. And what she is hoping, again, it's just a study, you know, you can you can study and you can hope, but the data will prove it out, is to actually show for all of the patients in her study, the the clients in her study, that before and after will actually make them all look much more like these than the urban Italians. So that is something that you know Coco can um, you know follow up a little bit next on um, her study. This is just everyone that's involved in the study, and we can go right on to my next one. So the next phase of my life, <laughs> five minutes or less, I feel like yeah, an hour talk compressed to twelve minutes. Um, it's like a little TED talk. But so, ten minutes. ten minutes. Oh, I have ten minutes. You're great. Oh gosh, yeah, we're cruising. Okay, so I get this nagging, nagging feeling. Oh my gosh, it's like there's just too many people. 1.6 million diagnosed with cancer every year in this country. What else can I be doing? I love funding these studies. I love speaking around the world for, and actually more around the country, you know, trying to get cancer centers to have dietitians, nutrition being part of their comprehensive cancer care. And there's movement, oh, but not fast enough for me. So I've got to do something on the prevention end. 
our farm, okay? <laughs> it's like, okay, here we are, um, starting because we didn't have farming backgrounds, but we're gonna figure out how to actually be members of our community and really focus on community health. So our logo, or actually it's our vision statement really for our farm is shaping our future from the ground up. And we are a certified organic farm. Some of you have already met my husband. You know, he's been around, he's been at some of the other farmer sessions and you just randomly met him. Um, but I could not do what I'm doing, as I'll explain um, after this, you know, without my husband. Next. Again, you saw this slide this morning, chronic disease in the United States. This is what I <coughs> added to it. And, you know, as I said, 1.6 million people in this country alone diagnosed with cancer every year. How do we put up with that? And going on to you know, another great Wendell Berry quote, which he says, you know, to be interested in food but not food production is clearly absurd, which is what really helped us make the commitment to having our farm be an organic farm, really going deep down into paying attention to how are we producing food, not just what are we producing. Okay. So, okay, that's great, we love that. But again, you know, these things nag at me, and it's like, am I doing enough? What else can I be doing? How is this farm really helping um, public health or community? So I get this email out of the blue from a student, and I'm gonna read it to you. Why are we learning nothing? She's a dietetic student at a major university. Does not need to be named. <laughs> Why are we learning nothing about agriculture in our dietetics <coughs> degree, such as which agriculture methods of food production increase nutrient content of foods and the long-term health of our soils? As part of our re education about food, why aren't future RDs required to have some experience, at least exposure, working on a farm that is producing food? Should I change majors? Okay, there's my challenge. There's, <laughs> if you choose to accept, you know, this is like, wow, this is it, next. And so I had the opportunity to actually develop just because I thought, why not? You know, it's like, how am I gonna get dietitians on farms? How am I gonna teach them how to answer this question that this student actually <coughs> approached me just by email, she didn't know me, you know, to actually answer. And so I wrote a program, a national program for the American Dietetic Association that brings students, allows students as a volunteer activity to come to our farm and actually some come and live with us for two weeks, others come as a whole class and you know, spend a whole day on our farm, some come, oh there's all kinds of ways that they come. I've lost track now of the number of dietetic students that I've had um, the fortune of interacting with on our farm. And it really is a means of connecting dietitians who do have organic farms and young, new dietitians. So let's, next please. So the, the focus, you know, it's, uh, there's, there's like this whole umbrella for the American Dietetic Association and there's little focus groups underneath and there's one little focus group called the Hunger and Environmental Nutrition Practice Group. This is essentially their mission. These are their values. I pledge allegiance to the earth, the flora, the fauna, and human life that it supports one planet indivisible with safe air, water, soil, economic justice, equal rights, and peace for all. That is my mantra. This is in some way, shape, or form what I am teaching this next generation of dietitians. Next. So then I had the good fortune, so I got this all in my head and got this all approved, and, which is remarkable if you know anything about bureaucracy, um, to, to actually get this program approved um, in less than a year. I had the opportunity to meet Dr. Michael Hamm from the Center for Regional Food Systems at Michigan State and you know, introduced myself and told him what I was doing. And I said, you know, if I had an elevator speech, what would it be, you know, I mean, to like sell this program? And he just said, it's so simple, Diana. No soil, no farms, no farms, no food. Focus. Yes, you think I'm all over the place. No, I am focused on soil. So, and 
This quote is the most beautiful quote, and it's what I try to leave my students with. Soil is the tablecloth underneath the banquet of civilization. How can we not pay attention to how our food is produced and that production method? What is it doing to our soil? OK, next. So we have this whole program. Um, it is marketed, not enough, but you know, it is throughout the whole academy, of nutrition and dietetics. There are two farmers, two dietitians, me and one in Minnesota, who have USDA certified organic farms and we bring students through there. I mean, they're, 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 it's really, it's remarkable how much interest and how much change and how much is happening with that. Okay, next please. So again, Wendell Berry, yeah, one of my, I guess my heroes, you know, I mean, he certainly helps me focus and share, you know, the, the focus of that message is, you know, with all of you, eating is an agricultural act. Yes, everything that we do is impacting that. And what I try to teach my students who are learning from their education that the baseline for our profession, the baseline for health is we are what we eat, is to instead say, no, no, Take them back several steps. Production, production. We are what we grow and how we grow it. Next. And to also re help them re know that everything that comes out of their mouth professionally is supporting a system that is regenerating our natural resources, protecting them, or degrading them. And that they have this responsibility to be on, to understand what their recommendations actually are impacting. And I'm really mean, I tell them there's no neutral. No, nope, you're on one side or the other. <laughs> okay. Uh, benefits, again, you know, Michael Hamm has been in, very influential for me. I'm, I'm glad that he has YouTube videos <laughs> too, so I don't have to take notes like mad when I hear him speak. But, you know, the bottom line for what we are doing, true sustainability, is the three-legged stool. The economic, the environmental, and the social health. And that's what I try to teach, you know, our students that they are a part of this. They are a part of driving these outcomes. Next. Yeah. Oh, and I'll just, you know, we're almost done here. And I'm just going to, like, share a few comments from them. These are some of my students. I, I, you know, I can't put photos up for all of them anymore. But, you know, my experience showed me the big picture. You know, it, they never, here's a, a student that, who's finishing your dietetics degree who actually has an undergraduate degree from, um, oh, what is it, Johnson & Wales Culinary Institute in Delaware or Rhode Island. She goes, I never thought about where my food came from. Oh, thank you. Okay, so I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> so we're going to change that. <laughs> and again, you know, we're not taught to consider agricultural's impact on all of these, you know, factors. Okay, and let alone health. Next, please. Okay. Um, I learned the importance of being concerned with local community partners. Yes, oh, thank you. I wrote to all my students, you know, like, I don't know, whenever I was first asked to talk this, give this talk, I said, okay, five words or less, five sentences or less, tell me, what did you learn <laughs> on our farm? And I got back so many wonderful answers. I'm just sharing a few. But this one who said, I learned about partners, that's what I thought, oh, thank you, yes. So important, we've heard it all morning today. The most memorable experience I had was an empowering lesson to eat more mindfully. We heard that this morning. And I am confident that I will leave these two weeks. Oh, here's a student who's still coming. She hasn't even been here yet, but she wrote me. She goes, I'm confident I will leave these two weeks with greater insight and appreciation of the food we eat, where it comes from, and the power that it has on both our land and our bodies. Next. They are our future. I mean, and I'm going to focus on and, and end with just this one. Nicole, who is just finished her dietetic internship. She, previous to that, had a two-year uh, Master's of Public Health program through the University of Michigan with then going right into her dietetic internship. D between that first and second year of that Master's of Public Health, they have to do a field experience. They can do anything they want. And she, again, the power of the internet, found me. She was totally focused on oncology and gardening. And what a combination. So everything we did that summer focused on oncology. We, everything we did, we brought back to oncology. 
and then growing. So she got lots of experience with square foot gardening, with garden tower type of gardening, and of course I took her and she spent some time at the farm at St. Joe's too. She has now been hired as the first outpatient oncology dietitian that St. Joe's in Ann Arbor has had. Finally, oh my gosh, I've been working on that for 20 years. And she will, as soon as she gets her feet on the ground in that outpatient oncology clinic position, she will be relentless in getting that hospital, that clinic, that little slice of St. Joe's and those patients involved with the farm. Next. That's, I think, the best thing that I can tell you. What do I say? Oh, a garden, yes. You know, a garden is a labor of love. A treadmill is just labor. So practical advice, don't wait for data. <laughs> don't wait for all my studies to be done or for a student of mine to show up and, and help you. But get your patients. Get your community, get your family gardening. Gardening, get them outside, even if they're growing herbs on a windowsill. You know, it is something. And to connect, connect, connect with our local food community because it is the future for our collective health. Thank you. talk to me later if there's not time for questions. I will be at the table that's just right outside here and you can ask me um, anything. All right. Well, hello again. We're going to talk about you today. Um, I, this is about your guts. And so this is going to be a little bit more clinical, but it's going to be totally connected with farms and food, as you will see. But I want you to be thinking about your own GI systems and GI systems of your friends, and that's not a topic everybody always talks about. <laughs> uh, just the premise here is that I focus on the underlying causes and the roots of disorders and disease, and that is basically the byline of functional medicine as a functional medicine nutritionist. Hippocrates said, all disease begins in the gut. How many times does your doctor ask, how's your gut? <laughs> Aside from, are you regular? And for one person, regular might be once a week. And for some, someone else, it might be five times a day. So what is regular? Uh, Hippocrates is also the author of that very well-known comment or phrase, um, let food be thy medicine and medicine thy food. You're hearing that theme all day today. Another great quote, you're hearing great quotes all day long. I don't think I'll read all the great quotes, um, but I love this one. And realize that the gut is the soil of your body. You have to take care of your gut. You have to integrate it with your food. Okay. okay. Uh, we are food from farms from factories, from laboratories. What we are, what we eat, we are, but we're also what we eat, digest, absorb, and metabolize, and detoxify. So we're not just simply, you are what you eat. Now, we're gonna be talking today about the gut microbiome, all those little co-inhabitators, but you'll also hear the term flora, and you'll also hear the term bacteria. So bacteria, microbiome, flora, all interchangeable. So the background of this all is gonna be this bacteria and how it influences every aspect of your health. Fatigue, something as simple as fatigue. Who would think maybe it's my bacteria in my gut that are uh, creating compounds and metabolites that are causing fatigue in my brain. Uh, pain, your skin, gut flora and skin are highly, highly related in terms of acne and rosacea and hives. Uh, vitamins, they make vitamins, they will regulate cardiometabolic syndrome and weight and all, every aspect of the body. 
the microbiome effects. And the Grand Central Station that drives all these reactions is that, your gut. So we're going to dig in. There's some key functions of the gut. Very simple. Digestion and absorption, intestinal permeability, the gut microbiome, which we're going to be focusing on, inflammation and immune pathways, and the nervous system, also called the enteric nervous system. Now, there's a microbiome project. You've heard little bits and pieces about that. And uh, we're focusing on the gut and stool microbiome. But this, these are some cool statistics, I think, that our microbial cells outnumber our human cells by 10 to 1, and that our microbial DNA outnumber our human DNA somewhere 100 to 200 to 1. So what are we mostly? <laughs> there is no perfect microbiome. A microbiome is like a fingerprint, but unlike a fingerprint, it changes over time. It's modifiable, and you modify it most with your diet. So just imagine two tennis courts, and then take your GI system and lay it all out. That's how much surface area there is to your GI system each one person. And about 95% of all the bacteria in your body reside in your gut. And your stool is equal food, food waste and biomass. So if someone complains about your stool odor, you just say, it's not me, it's my biomass. It's the, bi it's the microbes who did that, not me. Your gut flora in your body, for maybe a 200-pound person, can weigh up to five pounds. And the gut flora make vitamins, create enzymes that are involved in digestion and metabolism. And they modulate inflammation, and they affect every organ in your body. The um, colon is the biggest reservoir of your bacteria in the GI tract. So when we look at biodiversity, and I love this, biodiversity is life, is our life. So in the human gut, we measure diversity, and that's some of the testing that I do. Um, and for the most part, as you've heard today, the more biodiverse the soil, the healthier the soil, the more biodiverse the gut, the healthier the gut. And so. Most of my patients that come in, who are really are, like I called them earlier, the walking wounded, have very low diversity association. And so a big part of the plan is to, as Diana was alluding to, is, is like work on the microbiome through diet and sometimes through supplementation. So what are um, microbes? You know, they can be good and they can be bad and they can just be there and not be good or bad or they can be potentially pathogenic if they get out of balance. So these are just a few names of the good guys and the bad guys, but one term we're going to be um, uh, focusing on is dysbiosis, and that's when you're out of balance, when your microbes are out of balance. And these might be some of your symptoms, and I'm not going to read through this list on the left, but I can almost guarantee, maybe this is a healthier crowd, this is maybe not the average, average American crowd with a standard American diet, but if it were, one in four people in here right now would say, I've got something going on with my gut that I don't like. So it's so common, and more than one thing, too. So the causes of dysbiosis are all of these on the right. It's different medications, it's stress, it's GMO foods, it's infections, processed diet, and so forth. Now, one of the things that happens from dysbiosis and from inflammation and immune issues in the gut is something called leaky gut. It's also known as intestinal permeability. This is going on for a lot of people. I really don't know what the statistic is, but it's high. And so the kind of symptoms you have are all those inflammatory symptoms and a lot of the ones that you saw with dysbiosis. And what happens with leaky gut is that there's a breakdown in the barrier the absorptive barrier of, of the gut, where there are something called tight junctions. So gluten, gluten's a hot topic. People go, well, am I, 
am I celiac? Am I gluten intolerant? Am I gluten sensitive? And let's, uh, you know, like figure all that out. Bottom line is if when you eat gluten, you get these symptoms either inside your gut or outside your gut, this is leaky gut happening when all of a sudden you're finding that huh, there might be a tie-in with, um, you know, my gas or my distension or my uh, uh, unhealthy bowels and my arthritis and my fatigue or my depression or my skin. And I have to tell you that there is a subset of the population, maybe 10%, that have total silent gluten sensitivity. They don't feel a thing in their gut, but they're dealing with anemia, they're dealing with um, osteoporosis, and maybe some of these other outside of the gut issues. So you can't always go by gut symptoms. So this is a very simplified version of how um, I would look at somebody's gut. And it's, it's a, the four R's of the gut. And the first is you need to remove what's there that shouldn't be there. Are there pathogens in the gut? You have to measure those pathogens. You have to do in-depth stool testing to find out. You can't just guess. and you know, slap on different probiotics or enzymes and so forth. You really should know what you're targeting. So you want to remove pathogens. You want to remove allergens. So you need to really drill down and find out what kind of food allergies someone might be dealing with that they may have no clue. Um, xenobiotics are basically just foreign substances that aren't supposed to be there from uh, drugs and uh, BPA and things like that and that get into your body and create immune problems and heavy metals. So you need to clean up the diet and clean up the environment that the person lives in that might be also affecting the gut. And then you replace. So what I will do is look and find out, is this person, is their pancreatic function making enough uh, uh, digestive enzymes so they're able to digest? Um, is the body making its own hydrochloric acid? We're, such, we're in such an antacid um, mindset here with everything is Tums and you know, proton pump inhibitors and, and kill that acid, but that acid is absolutely essential for digestion. It also protects you from microbes that you're ex exposed to all the time. It's gonna get down into your GI tract if you're too low in hydrochloric acid. And uh, so, which happens a lot for elderly people, but also people who are constantly popping antacids. And maybe replace with fiber. Uh, Reinoculate. So when I'm looking at um, a stool and I'm looking at, uh, well, what kind of bacteria, what kind of yeast, what kind of parasite, if they're there, are in that stool, and uh, what kind of beneficial bacteria is there, so then we may have to re-inoculate with um, probiotics and specific probiotics and prebiotics, which I'll be telling you about that. Prebiotics are basically foods that feed bacteria. But I'll be showing you how they feed good bacteria, but in some cases they feed bad bacteria and you don't want to use them. So, And then repair. Working with diet, which contains <clears throat> a quite a bit of um, healing properties, for example, something like bone broth um, and, and other foods, uh, nutrients, specific nutrients and herbs and fatty acids that all are involved in repairing the gut. So there's a low-tech approach and a high-tech approach. And the low-tech approach really doesn't cost anything. And so it'd be maybe working with an elimination diet where you take out the most commonly offending foods and you put someone on a very anti-inflammatory and hypoallergenic diet and for about a month and you just see what happens. And then you reintroduce foods one at a time very, very slowly to monitor reactions. That's a cheap, easy way to go. Um, and you might bring in the use of prebiotic and probiotic foods and fiber and, and, uh, and then the tests you might do, there's a home test for testing your hydrochloric acid capacity um, that's very easy and you can also do, and I know this isn't like scientifically proven, but, but I gotta tell you, it seems to correlate um, very well with stool tests and there's a spit test that you can do in water to see if your spit actually sinks or floats to give an idea of whether there might be a candida overgrowth. I know it sounds a little flaky, but I have seen so much correlation with that. And for people who don't want to spend on testing, it's one thing they can do so long as they don't look at it as an absolute you know, validation. And then the high-tech approach would be a comprehensive stool analysis. And I recommend this for people who are really dealing with chronic problems. Um, 
organic acid analysis, which is looking at metabolites of different uh, microbes and yeast and uh, in, in the gut and to find out if those are, are up. And food allergy testing, gluten antibody testing, and a variety of different supplements, but they would be targeted. Now, what changes the microbiome faster than anything you can do? Yeah, diet. So whether it's high fat, low fiber, low fiber, high fat, diet will change your microbiome in 24 hours. It's the most modifiable intervention. You don't have to swallow bacteria necessarily. Now this study just came out and I thought it was very cool. Um, just uh, was published on January 14th. And uh, you know, the journal is the Molecular Nutrition and Food Research Journal. Bottom line here is that let's say you eat this perfect diet all week of greens and all your best farm foods, organic, and then you just splurge on weekends and have your junk food thinking, hey, I've been good all week, and it is no different what it does to your microbiome and taking it down than if you were to eat junk food every single day. So there's no such thing as splurging on the weekend. And maybe, you know, it's not like I'm trying to be like this strict ogre, but there's no neutrality, to borrow your term. There's just, you, there's, you know, and in, and in a way, too, you gotta think, what am I telling my body? You know, it's, it's a message to your body. I'm gonna like be good to you and then I'm gonna mess with you, so. <laughs> These are some different diets. You will find the books, you'll read about them in the literature that have been helpful for a lot of people with various um, uh, digestive disorders uh, that help in restoring the microbiome. I'm not gonna go into these diets uh, specifically today, but I wanted them to be up here for you as, as a reference point. Now we're gonna talk about prebiotics and probiotics. And that little symbiotic, that's just a, like when you combine the two. So um, I wanna show you about what prebiotic foods are. I, I'm just gonna see first, can someone just tell me a prebiotic food quickly? Okay. Yeah, okay, good. You're, you're, and, and people sometimes get the prebiotic and the probiotic. Now, yogurt and kefir is a probiotic food. It's not a prebiotic because it contains the live bacteria, and so you're getting it directly. These are the foods that actually feed bacteria in the gut. And these are probiotic foods that already have live culture in them. <laughs> Kind of reminds you a little bit of lunch? Yeah. But um, one thing, and this happens in nutrition a lot, um, you know, you, a person becomes a fan of, you know, one style of dieting or one style of eating or one major brand of supplementation, and then it's like a religion, right? And, and you can hear good sides from good points on all sides. But, when you go to a nutritionist who's really digging deep and looking at root causes, you need to look at the individual. And here's a case where if you've got small intestinal bowel overgrowth, which is tested on a breath test, or if you've got um, irritable bowel syndrome, um, or if you're allergic to FODMAPs, it's a, a specific diet, um, specific um, carbohydrates in the diet, then these prebiotic foods could make you a lot worse. So you, you don't just run and hear, oh, I heard prebiotics are really good because they feed the good bacteria. Well, depending upon who you are, that may or may not be the best idea. There might be some other things you need to do first before those prebiotics can be help, helpful. So we're gonna come back to Earth again. And our um, human microbiome is intrinsic, intrinsically linked to Mother Earth's microbiome. You have received that message all day today. We know that. But just seeing it in different images and hearing it from different people, you'll, you're gonna, it's gonna be so inside of you when you leave. Um, the Earth Microbiome Project and the Human Microbiome Project are all connecting at the same time. This came from the Atlantic, um, magazine, the single greatest leverage point for a sustainable and healthy future for the seven billion people on the planet is arguably immediate 
completely underfoot the living soil where we grow our food. It is the tablecloth under which we, under which we survive. And obviously the microbial community in our gut is just as important as that of the soil, or back and forth, vice versa. So you have plant microbiomes, and earlier today, Dr. Daphne Miller showed us a plant microbiome. And the role it plays in our community, you already know that, that really like plant, like human. Again, you know this. And here in this Nature magazine, in order to explain to people about their guts, they used the, a lawn as a metaphor for people to get what happens in the gut when you destroy it with antibiotics and you um, and don't eat the right foods and you end up with a, with a low microflora or low diversity gut and so forth. But they, had to, they use the, the, the lawn, which everybody knows what their lawn does, but they don't always connect it with their gut. So we can look, like in Western medicine, we see that the, we look at the um, body as more of a machine. Whereas in Eastern medicine, we look at the body more as a garden. And the outlook, it's really a war on disease. That's the conventional medical paradigm. And in the Eastern view, it's a collaborative effort in cultivating health with your doctor. And that's what we're going for. Um, there is a bacterium called Mycobacterium, and it's V-A-C-C-A-E. I am not sure of the pronunciation. Can someone help me in here? Vacae. Anyway, it has been shown to um, reduce depression. It has a, a prozac -y type of effect where it actually stimulates the um, uh, serotonin. And so we wonder, why do people feel better when they're gardening? What is it? People describe this glow or this feeling, and that's where the stress gets released. This is probably part of it, because it's, it's inhaled. So back to food as medicine. Uh, we know it you know, provides us with vitamins, minerals, and phytochemicals, and we're focused on microbes today, but also the fact that it's a source of grounding social meaning and earth medicine. And I just put this up for your amusement. How many of you have seen this before, where you can look at various foods and the organs that they help and how much they look alike, starting with the carrot and the eye or the kidney and the kidney bean, um, the sweet potato and the pancreas, Avocados, uterus, I just always think that's such beautiful synergy. <laughs> now, this is, um, I'm going to talk about crosstalk. There are talk, excuse me, okay, edible plants talk to our cells. And we're going to start out with something called exosomes. And these are like inside the cytosol of, a, cytosol of a cell, there are these little things called exosomes and they have a lipid layer around them and they contain information and they send information on cell to cell signaling, inflammation and so forth. And they are secreted by both plant and animal cells and they actually talk to each other within the body but they also talk cross species. And so this is a study um, on uh, these four foods, ginger, grapes, carrots and grapefruit. How am I doing on time? I just, I'm good? OK. Um, they regulate epigenetic expression. Epigenetic expression is the world we live in. You know, we all come with our genes, but the epigenetics is everything that happens to our genes. So for example, let's say I come from a family with a high risk of diabetes. I may or may not ever give, get diabetes based on what I do with my lifestyle. Am I exposed to, to xenobiotic chemicals that act as an endocrine disruptor and promote diabetes? Am I eating the foods um, that are going to promote diabetes? Do I have a, a sedentary lifestyle? Am I under high stress and all these things? I may never get it. So that's the epigenetic effect, just so you understand what that term is. These foods regulate epigenetic expression to influence your immunity, inflammation, and tissue healing, and other factors. And they are resistant to uh, digestive juices in, in the stomach, gastric and intestinal digestion. So they are living molecules. They don't get eaten up by your digestion and destroyed. So it's so important to eat a wide variety of fruits and vegetables and eating your whole rainbow of colors. We've co-evolved forever. We know that with plants and we're very codependent. And exosomes may eventually become classified as nutrients. 
which is fascinating to me. Because you remember the days, any of you, when there were just vitamins and minerals? And now what do we have? We have all these phytochemicals, and um, now we're so interested in all the colors and, and of, that comes from the fibers and the colors of different fruits and vegetables and the power they have to regulate our immune system and inflammation and to influence our DNA. Um, but here it might be a new category of nutrients on the way called exosomes. Okay, gut talk in daily life. I am not going to read all of this because some of it you may not want me to read, or you might. But we talk, we're talking about, first we're talking on the, on the, on the topic of talking. We're, we're first talking about how edible plants talk to ourselves and how we can um, now, we also talk to our guts all the time, don't we? And our guts talk to us. How many metaphors do we have for life around our gut, right? We have this very intimate relationship. So, not surprising that our guts and brains talk to each other too. And this is a, a gut talking to a brain playing chess saying, gutsy move for a, for a brain. <laughs> so cute, thank you. <clears throat> so we have an enteric or a gut, immune, a gut nervous system that contains 500 million neurons. 90% of the serotonin is made in our gut and also other metabolites like dopamine, norepinephrine, acetylcholine, melatonin, ap uh, hormones like ghrelin and leptin that influence our hunger and our appetite, and opiates from gluten and casein sensitivity. So we measure that sometimes, because sometimes people just don't know if gluten bothers them or dairy, but you can actually, you can actually measure the opiates of these, and because they do create an addiction, and if anyone has gone off Gluten before, some people actually go through actual withdrawal due to um, coming off this, this opiate-like reaction. The microbes make neuroactive substances. And I'm going to give you, you've got to, when you have a chance and you'll be able to do this, um, look at this uh, YouTube. This was um, actually a patient of mine who is now, um, it's kind of all over, but I'm not in the YouTube at all. I was behind the scenes. Um, and it was on 2020. Now, everyone knows, have you heard of Sarcomyces? I can never pronounce this, but Cerevisiae? No. So, okay, it's, the, it's the, um, the yeast that's used in winemaking and bread making, um, and, it, and it ferments uh, diet, and baking, bread, bake, bread baking. I mean, it ferments dietary sugars and carbohydrates to ethanol. This man was gut drunk. So he was, he was um, sadly thought to be abusing alcohol. He was arrested three times the legal limit. Um, he, he, could, he came to my office. He had to lie down. He could barely talk. His wife brought him from Ohio. And I measured his yeast in his gut. And it was well above the highest tolerable limit for yeast. And I wanted to put him on a no yeast, no sugar, no carbohydrate diet. But he had lost so much weight, I was very worried about malnutrition coming on my hands. So I referred him to a physician who had initially referred him to me. I referred him back to the physician with this information about the yeast overgrowth. And this physician in Ohio, in Columbus, actually monitored him and got him off and monitored that malnutrition. And he is in great shape now. But this is quite a story um, because everyone su suspected he was abusing. Now, I talked a little bit about leaky gut, but there's also leaky brain. So what happens is many of the metabolites that, that are um, uh, manufactured when you have leaky gut and you have dysbiosis, they make their way to the brain. And so symptoms such as anxiety and depression, ADHD, even autism, um, aspects of autism and neurodegenerative disorders and cognition, memory issues, this gut health is intimately connected to brain health. I have watched personalities change in my office that and when I was really learning all this, I, I was just astounded. Because you know how you are, like if you know you're going to meet with somebody and you know they're really like bristly, what do we do? We just like calm ourselves before they come in and everything. And, um, or someone who's always depressed and you just like, you try to like meet them where they're at, you know, that's the right thing to do. 
What I have watched by changing people's diets and getting their gut healthy, I've watched personality transformations. And it's one of the most gratifying things, especially when someone is just chronically um, dealing with uh, um, these kinds of uh, symptoms. This is just a little graph that shows, um, uh, wait, did I? Yeah. Um, this is just another way of looking. Those are the, the uh, leaky junctions right there and showing just how it affects the various factors that I just uh, spoke about, like depression and cogn cognition and so forth. And here's, if you want to go into the science of this more, it's quite interesting because the vagus nerve is a major highway between the gut and the brain, but also adrenal stress. You know, adrenal stress can come from anything like um, staying up too late, being under too much stress, too much physical output. It can come from a chronic infection that you don't even know you have and taking down your adrenals. And all of this will affect the gut and the gut will affect, and, and an unhealthy gut will affect that. And so um, uh, it's so intimately involved um, in, in uh, the immune and the inflammation pathways. Okay. How do you, what do you think? Absolutely. All right. There's so many, so many um, factors here from the not so subtle to the more subtle, if you really think about it. Um, CAFOs, confined animal uh, facility, facilities, um, uh, antibiotics that are used continuously <clears throat> um, to promote growth and to supposedly control infections, but it's really mostly to to promote growth. We end up getting those antibiotics, as all of you know, and, and the resistant bacteria that come from that. And feed that contain GMO corn both is taking in more toxins and more allergens. And um, all the alterations to your gut flora from this can create changes in mental and emotional health. And then maybe the less subtle but very, very um, kinesthetic to me and, and many of you here is how these animals are treated and the stress that they live under and the, hormone, the hormonal rushes that they're experiencing throughout their lives and the stress on their guts. They have a lot of belly aches. They have a lot of diarrhea. They have a lot of problems, as, as you well know. And so all of this, we're taking in that energy, too, besides just the drugs or the hormones that they're on. We know this quote by Gandhi. Yeah. So there might be a new, well, there really is. This is just another name for it, but psychobiotics and really understanding how are we gonna treat people who have a messed up microbiome if we're ever gonna agree in conventional medicine that the microbiome makes any difference at all in, in daily health, then psychobiotics, which are basically targeted probiotics. And by that I mean, you know, we usually think, well, let's just take a probiotic. I'll take one that has like 50 billion versus five billion. I'll take one that looks like it has 25 strains rather than six. But, it's really kind of a roulette that most people are trying to guess what probiotics are good for them. It's going to be far more targeted by knowing what someone's microbiota is by testing it. And then what are the goals? You know, there are certain probiotics that work on anxiety. There's certain probiotics that work on depression or increasing GABA, which is a, a calming neurotransmitter. Uh, so, or, or certain probiotics that will help with certain infections. So we have to become more targeted with that rather than just saying in general probiotics. But that said, for many people, there is an ability to kind of do a, um, you know, take a probiotic and have it help you. And if you notice that it's helping you, then that's okay. You don't have to know everyone. But it, it, ultimately, I think it's going to become much more targeted in treatment. Any, any of you familiar with Dr. David Perlmutter? Yeah, so um, uh, these two books, Brain Maker and Grain Brain, and he also has another book, why am I blanking on it, you guys will know, um, Brain, he wrote it with Alberto Villos, the, the, yeah, one of his, yeah, but anyway, it really goes more into kind of the spiritual and micro, micro, microbial, um, firing up your brain or something like that, but these two books are very valuable if you're dealing with, um, issues of emotional health and mental health and want to really look at diet. Uh, the, 
The food you eat, and we're circling back to Hippocrates again. Remember, I had him up as the very first slide almost? And that, he died in 370 BC. And there's still the, the um, Hippocrates Health Institute. And Anne Wigmore was the founder of it. She passed away in 1994. And to me, this quote just is so, so simple and so um, foundational. The food you eat can either be the safest and most powerful form of medicine or the slowest form of poison. And here I just have like a general summary of eight points for your gut health to take it from not so good to better, uh, you know, fiber rich, avoiding sugar and processed foods, avoiding antibiotics and other drugs that mess with your microbiome and your digestion, obviously getting allergic foods out of your diet, but knowing what they are, finding out what they are, because allergies can manifest in so many different ways. You know, some allergies can manifest at literally like someone slipping you a drug and you want to fall asleep. Have you ever had that where like one minute you're okay and the next minute you feel like you're on a drug and you're trying to keep your eyes open and, and, and everything? Okay, so you would want to look at, you'd really want to test your food allergies uh, in those situations. Um, including probiotic and fermented foods and prebiotic foods and really considering specialized testing if you're not getting anywhere just with diet. Because people will often come to me and say, I've tried so many diets, but none of them work. Well, maybe none of them were targeting what was really wrong, and we have to dig deeper to find out. Uh, you know, underlying causes, root causes, not just treating symptoms. And, uh, and then, um, you know, appropriate targeted supplements after that. Uh, there are many publications, the microbiome, and how it affects our health is in so many journals and popular magazines. Um, these are two projects called the U-Biome and the American Gut Project. Have any of you heard of these at all? Yeah. No? So they're just collecting data. You can send in money and, I don't know, like maybe 100 bucks or something, and you can get your, um, your uh, uh, bacteria in your gut typed and see what phyla and what species are there. Um, it's really more for them to collect data, but there's some interesting information there. And there's also um, uh, many books that you might want to consider uh, on um, the microbiome and health. And uh, so I hope that you take some of this home, internalize it in your, in your gut, in your brain, and either help yourselves or help somebody else. And I thank you very much for being here.